Welcome to the Branding Boardroom, the podcast where we discuss brand strategy and how it should be understood, formulated, and implemented by senior corporate decision makers. Our guests range from prominent CEOs to accomplished academics and thought leaders, but there's so much more. They're also interesting people. And on the show, you'll get to learn about their stories and about the advice that they give to the world's top companies. My name is Ivo Ganchev. I'm your host and a senior executive at Top Brand Union, a Chinese consultancy which publishes influential ranking tables in the branding industry. We also organize the annual China Brand Festival. And this year, it's taking place right here in Changsha, where our secretariat is located. Now follow me into the branding boardroom. Sophie Bowman is a multi-award winning social media entrepreneur. She's an accomplished expert in branding, public relations and marketing. Sophie is a Forbes Council member and the founder of several companies including Brand Branding and ConvertYourFollowers.com. In addition to her previous accolades, in 2022, she was named Entrepreneur of the Year at the American Business Awards, receiving a Gold Stevie Business Award. Sophie's clients include global superstars such as Kanye West and John Legend, as well as established companies such as Saatchi and Saatchi. Sophie has also managed branding campaigns for some of the most well-known global events, such as London Fashion Week and the 2012 Olympic Games. She has recently been named as one of nine inspirational women to watch by Yahoo News. Sophie has lectured at Miami Ad School and she has authored the authoritative book How to Convert Your Social Media Followers to Customers. She's a highly sought public speaker and has VIP speaker status at the Wall Street Conference. Sophie has been widely covered by various media outlets such as Success Magazine, Lifestyle Magazine and Business Insider. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today, Sophie Bowman. Hi, Sophie. Where are you calling from? Hi, guys. I'm calling from Miami today. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you on our podcast. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, we're uh, most honored to have you here. So we've, uh, of course, uh, spoken about your previous achievements at the beginning of the podcast, and uh, you've been tremendously successful. You've built a great reputation and a considerable following within the industry. So there is a lot to talk about today, and I'm sure that our viewers are really excited about this episode. But uh, before we get into it, let's start by telling your story to our audience. How did you get to where you are today? What was your early career like, and uh, where did your passion for business come from in the first place? I love that question. So my background is interesting in the sense of... Um, I very much had a Richard Branson mentality to just say yes to every opportunity that came along, figure it out along the way, which obviously comes with a lot of stories, <laughs> horror stories, funny stories, but success stories, because I really believe that was like the driving force behind, you know, my career becoming successful is just ha going for so many different opportunities that it's like law of probability, you know? You have to get something. If you're kicking on 20 doors, you're gonna get at least five. So I think with that mentality, you know, I was working as a teacher in London and it was working with special needs children, something I always loved. But when they decided to, you know, change the law and um, everything else around education, I was like, okay, it's now or at or now or never, I have to get out. It's kind of like sink or swim. I don't want to teach for the rest of my life. I want to do something amazing. And that's around that time, I'd kind of fallen in love with business. You know, I had my own side hustle selling, you know, creative writing, copywriting, um, 
marketing, digital marketing, social media. So I was already kind of doing all this, um, you know, side hustle stuff. But turning 30 was, you know, a really big kind of milestone. So I think I had a little bit of an early midlife crisis. And, um, you know, I just decided to quit my job and make my side hustle a kind of creative agency and relocated to Morocco for two years just because I wanted to travel as well. So I just decided to do everything at once. Um, then around six years ago, I came to Miami and uh, I think that was the real power move for me. Um, coming to America being, you know, European, you have that bonus of knowing a, a lot of different uh, markets. And luckily for me, you know, having sold all of these different services, I had clients all over the world. So I've been lucky enough to, you know, work with clients in Asia and work with clients uh, US or you know, from Paris. So that's been a lot of like building that network has been, um, you know, the second kind of power move to success. And then, you know, global domination, next step. <laughs> Honestly, so I've always been kind of a little bit boho at heart, you know, like free spirit traveler. But I also, when I came to Miami, I had it in mind that you know, I really wanted to set up roots and kind of build a foundation, like have a home for the first time really ever. Because to me, you know, rental property is not home. You feel like you're constantly living out of a suitcase kind of. Um, so I think, you know, when I came to America with that different mentality, um, I personally stayed in Miami um, because I love, you know, the weather which sounds crazy, but you know, I get to wake up to the ocean every morning. Um, I see it from my balcony. I see dolphins and manatees. You just can't have that kind of lifestyle in a lot of other places. So although Miami wasn't the best move in terms of business stuff, because I probably would be way further along if I was in New York and on a lot more money. But, you know, for me, lifestyle is important and I can't imagine going back to live in a, a, you know, a city full time after, you know, being a beach girl. I would miss the ocean. So you've been very successful over the years uh, and definitely it seems to have been a good decision to move to the U.S. and to Miami as well specifically. But what do you think has made you so successful? Do you think that uh, there were perhaps some skills that you learned uh, during your earlier career as a teacher or from some other experiences? Or do you think it's uh, something else perhaps that has uh, brought to you this uh, level of success? Uh, definitely perseverance. <laughs> I think that's just, you know, my um, best friend's husband, um, the Napola family are like my adopted family over here in Florida. Um and her husband would always say to us, like, just start, you know, because you can sit around planning, 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 talking about stuff forever. But when you just start, you just kind of figure it out along the way. And that became like, you know, my mental kind of motivation, um, very much like, you know, just do it or whatever, just start. Well, throughout your uh your uh, work and also when we've had our conversations uh you definitely you've, you've always spoken very openly and you have a very fun personality you're definitely a ball of energy uh and you have so many uh ideas but uh, the way that you bring them in is uh so natural and so open and you tend to work with uh, quite a lot of high-end clients and you tend to appear a lot in public. So uh, what I've been wondering about is, do you always keep this uh, sort of open way of communication and this uh, natural personality or do you have to perhaps hold back when you talk to senior executives and, or when you talk to uh, magazines or when you go on TV shows? Um, so how do you sort of uh, manage that when you uh, when you are in different environments? Um, honestly, I'm always going to be, you know, myself, but, you know, around like more corporate executives and stuff. I mean, you have to match the energy, right? So it's all about kind of being a chameleon and a good entrepreneur, a good business person is going to know that you do have to adapt yourself a little bit to kind of, you know, match the energy at that moment. So, you know, it would be 
kind of silly, I guess, in a sense for people to kind of come in and think you can be exactly the same in every culture and every, you know, everything else because you can't. Well, of course, uh, all of that sounds uh, like it's uh, fascinating. And uh, now you've uh, started talking about social media, which is, uh, of course, one of your key areas of expertise. And um, this seems like a, a very nice segue of moving into uh, this topic as well. Now, one of the hot trends on social media these days is uh, working with influencers and uh, building campaigns uh, which involve them as well. So... Um, what uh, I'd just like to start with here is uh, a bit of a conceptual or definitional question. Now, of course, we've had uh, uh, celebrities or other well-known people within communities influence the preferences um, of the market for a very, very long time. But uh, the concept of influencers these days seems to be quite new in the way that it has developed um, on social media. So when you look at, for example, celebrities in the past and uh, influencers these days, um, would you say that uh, the, these two concepts are fundamentally different? Or uh, you would uh, perhaps um, find a lot of similarities between them as well? Honestly, yeah. I've been lucky enough to um, work with both, you know, the big celebrities and also the influencers. And I think the real differentiation was, you know, with the, the movement of kind of, I guess it was the rise of Kim Kardashian. Um, and that became really popular. You know, people really then started understanding, okay, she's, you know, being paid to show us this. And people really became kind of close to it. So... I think what brands really figured out is that, you know, we, especially women, also men, of course, we follow people that we're really kind of interested in that their niche is like our favorite thing. So let's say it could be makeup for darker skin tones or, you know, I'm going to follow very specific people because I like their style. I like who they are as a person. And that's a lot more personable um, to, you know, connect with an influencer because especially if they've, you know, made uh, recommendations before and you've purchased products because you've seen them through them and they've all been amazing, then of course you're going to keep going back. And I think, um, you know, most countries are starting to figure out now that it it's major, like influencer marketing, you know, it's normally one of the first costs to be cut. And I just read something in Business Insider yesterday saying, you know, uh, companies are going to start cutting off, you know, their marketing budget, their, um, you know, everyone's trying to save costs where they can. But I'm seeing a completely different story because, you know, I'm seeing a rise in clients wanting to connect and work with influencers on the long term, which is exactly, you know, the, the whole idea of influencer marketing. I mean, myself being an influencer on the side, um, something that I kind of fell into, I built my own social media kind of as a, a calling card to potential clients and also to have an account to test certain things before, you know, I go AWOL on a client's account. So that's the only reason why I built mine, but it's also ended up being another revenue stream. Um, you know, I have a lot of uh, brands now um you know, like sending me really expensive products in return for posting about it. But the trick with influencer marketing is, you know, yeah, it's great for free products and stuff to send us. But if it's only just one off free product that we post, that's not going to be a value. You know, there's a reason why certain brands have been very successful. Like um, Fashion Over is a great example of, you know, very aggressive marketing and they know the clientele um, and they built the brand pretty much purely on influencer marketing um, so you know it's still very very powerful and you know something that when I come over to China next year I'm sure we're gonna end up doing some kind of workshop on that because influencer marketing is not going anywhere and with the recession about to hit you know the entire globe in this post-covid mayhem it's definitely gonna be something that you know, people are going to have to get into influencer marketing because it's the only cost effective way to reach a certain number of people online. Definitely. It doesn't seem like it's a trend that's going away anytime soon. And um, 
of course, it's something that companies have to think about. Now, you're very experienced in terms of working with uh, influencers and uh, perhaps uh, co-creating campaigns as well together as well. But in order to um, do this successfully, of course, you have to get influencers uh, who are actually uh, appropriate in terms of uh, matching well with the brand. And you want to get um, influencers uh, that are the best fit for a particular company. So. The question here is, how do you do this? How do you get their attention in the first place? How do you get your uh, message opened? How do you select the right influencers? Um, and uh, how do you approach them about a collaboration? So that's a really good question because I think sometimes, you know, being on both sides of the fence, being an influencer and a brand person, you know, I see all the mistakes. So first of all, you have to have a really strong brand. You know, like if I see a message from you and go check out your Instagram page, I need to see activity. I need to understand immediately from your feed what you do. Your bio has to tell me, you know, what you do and why you're reaching out to me. It just has to click. Um, one little trick that I used to use when I was trying to find influencers for a brand is you know first off you want to find influencers that share that niche so let's say for example i'm working with a cosmetic brand then i only really want to deal with makeup artists and beauty influencers um and sometimes you can go a little outside of that scope um if someone's more of a lifestyle influencer but they have a very good local following um but I think it's best to start, you know, maybe go on Instagram and search certain hashtags. Let's say you're a, you know, we'll just stay with the cosmetics brand. Um, you have a beauty brand in China, then you would want to go through, you know, beauty influences and then make it very specific. Uh, make it local influences if you're a local business. If you're kind of global platform, then you're in a, better position because you can use all types of influences from all over the world. You know, a very good example of that again is Fashion Nova. Um, but the most ideal thing really, like once you have everything with your brand, you know, very concise and strong, you can then reach out, you know, maybe by direct message and say, you know, you have to address me. Sorry, I just thought of another really important tip. Um, Always, 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 when you message uh, an influencer, if you're going to direct message them on Instagram, whatever, make sure you start the message with hi, their first name. Because if you don't do that, then it's immediately obvious to me that, um, you know, you're just spamming. You're just going through. You're not really taking the time to find influencers. And as an influencer, that's, a you know, an immediate red flag because if you're just taking anyone and everyone like that's just you know it's going to be messy and i don't want to be seen to support a messy brand you know so that's kind of the most important step you know look at your social media is it obvious to a potential client as soon as they hit on your page are they going to understand what you're selling what you do within three seconds um once you have that set up then you can have you know, a template for a message you send to influencers, you know, like, hi, Sophie, um, you know, we've been following you and we love your branded posts. We would love to discuss, you know, a collaboration with you if you're interested, you know, please fill out this link, um, availability, and let's schedule time to talk. Keep it very simple, you know, don't send a very long, 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 long message. No one's going to read it. <laughs> Just get the, you know, I'm very much a fan of short and sweet. Just get directly to the point. Ask them what they want, you know, ask for their media card. That way it kind of shows what you're, you know, what you're doing. And you'll also get insights from that. You know, how many followers do they have? Where are their followers? Because that makes a big difference if you're a global brand or a local brand you know, you have to pick influences based on geographic location, um, what their niche is. You know, there's a lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration. And like you said before, um, you know, the influences you go for can make or break your brand. You know, like, let's just say um, with influences, if you had a luxury brand, but then you're using influences that kind of also promote cheap 
fashion brand, you know, it's not, everything has to be very concise and a consistent brand tone. And that's why, you know, people like you and I exist because even though we know branding inside out, it's amazing, you know, how many businesses are still missing out on so many sales and so much opportunity because they don't have a strong social media presence. These steps are definitely really helpful, uh, both in terms of uh, the practicalities of how you approach influencers and, of course, as well as uh, uh, creating the brand strategy as well and making sure that um, everything aligns. And these influencers, of course, they already have uh, big followings. And this is also something that... Um, a lot of companies hope to do um, as well, and this is one of the important metrics on their social media, how many followers they have. So if we uh, flip things from the perspective um, of the company, uh, this is something that uh, it has to do as well to attract followers. So when you are giving advice to a company on how to um, do this uh, themselves, uh, what would you tell them? What are some strategies that you would perhaps uh, uh, um, think are useful for our audience in terms of attracting a big following? For me, I think building a following is, you know, you have to go with authenticity. Like people expect and kind of deserve a lot more from brands now. You know, like they don't just want fast fashion brand they want a brand that is thinking about you know where the products are made they they want to know are you helping the environment you know like there's so many different factors that go into it now in terms yeah building a following you know you have to create content with who your target consumers are in mind so once you start nailing that then you can get really kind of personal with your followers so you know show behind the scenes create a lot of reels because a lot of brands don't realize that let's say for example if I post a static image or a video on my Instagram feed the only people that are going to see that are some of my followers who are online at that time or you know a few people that might find me via hashtags whereas you know if you create a reel especially with a trending um, sound you can go from, you know, a thousand likes to 15,000 views. So, you know, just by that simple trick of, you know, using different images or creating reels, it's very, very simple. Um, and instead of, you know, you're multiplying your online reach by like 15 times just by using a reel. And I think a lot of brands now kind of know about that, but they're still not doing it. Well, that makes sense, definitely, especially with the decreasing attention span um, across the world, really, and with a lot of these uh, new interactive uh, social media platforms, uh, the TikTok-style apps uh, that uh, show you a lot of these short videos. Um, reels seem to be something that is uh, certainly uh, picking up. Uh, but um, once you uh, start to... Um, build that following, uh, sometimes you get a lot of traction and things snowball and that's fantastic. Uh, and sometimes perhaps you might not get uh, as much traction to begin with. So if this happens, if you're not getting a lot of traction, uh, some companies have um, ended up uh, doing things like uh, buying followers at times. That's uh, one of the uh, things that's probably uh, not as uh, talked about these days, but uh, it's certainly uh, something that still remains. Um, so what would you say to these types of companies? Should they continue with their strategy if they're not getting traction? Should they buy followers or should they change their entire approach? That's a really good question. And I think, you know, what I see a lot is uh, an increase of brands using uh, an existing member of staff to handle the marketing and it doesn't work like that you know that's like trying to put a random person off the street into a scientist job and expecting them to you know know what to do you have to be educated in social media and if your strategy isn't working you've got to change the strategy you know it's like so anything else in business if something's not working you change the strategy and if you don't know how, you bring in an expert. You know, now we're in a really cool position where we can connect with experts from anywhere in the world. So, you know, like that's changed the game. Companies and corporations, they can now bring in a contractor such as myself, which I'm seeing a huge increase in, by the way. Um, 
you know, I just found out yesterday that I've won a marketing leadership award. So I'm being flown to Dubai and um, then Vegas to collect awards and speak at the events and everything. Corporations, there's literally no point in buying followers because one of the most uh, important things is your engagement rate. If you're an aspiring, you know, influencer or whatever, everyone's going to look at those insights. So let's say you buy followers. They're probably going to be fake accounts or accounts that were set up and haven't been posted on since like a year or two years. You know, the Instagram algorithm is highly intelligent. So first of all, it knows if you're doing it. But second of all, it just looks so bad for your brand. People instantly think you're not ethical. You know, you're trying to cheat the system. These are not good for building, you know, brand longevity and you know, loyalty and trust in your brand. So it's best not to do it. It's better to have 500 engaged followers than 5,000 that don't interact on anything because, you know, people are a bit more tech savvy now. They'll go to your Instagram feed, for example, and they will look. Let's say, you know, you, you purchased 100,000 followers, but if I go and look at your post, there's like three likes per post, no comments. You know, it's obvious.